Thank you, Joan. Um, John, um, John, uh, the team at uh, Wendy and the team at European Cancer League, uh, Mari, who just uh, preceded me with this inspiring presentation of Healthy Ireland. Healthy Ireland. Um, uh, I uh, bid you good morning, and it's a great delight for me to be here. A bit excited. This is my second time in Dublin, and. Uh, I came in 1987 with a well-thumbed version of a portrait of the artist as a young man, and the man at the passport office thought I was being quirky when I asked him to stamp it for me and completely refused to do so. <laughs> in those days, I came to uh, look at the Kilkenny Health Project and to organize a twinning arrangement. I still worked from my home country, Malta, at that time uh, with the Health Education Bureau, and uh, connections with Ireland, though I have never been here, uh, since have been very intense and, and very friendly. Today, uh, it is my turn to be yet again uh, inspired, and I will make a reference to that in my presentation. A uh, quick brief of three C's in cancer, context, conflict, and code, and I thought, let's start. Yesterday, no, was it the day before? I've been traveling and I've lost track. Um, the day before, on Monday, the World Health Assembly um, made a decision that's been coming for two years. It's been hard fought, long, and the decision, if you go to the website indicated in a letter, later slide, you won't even find the documents there because it's just too early for the documents to go up on, uh, on the website. But we have, finally, agreement from all member states of the World Health, Associ uh, World Health Organization, I forget the name of my own agency, um, the, uh, the Global Monitoring Framework, 25 indicators have been agreed uh, by all the member states, uh, not just of Europe, uh, but of the whole world. Uh, 25 indicators that have been part of the uh, requirement that the United Nations high-level meeting has requested of us, um, WHO and the Global Movement on Non-Communicable Diseases, plus the nine voluntary targets uh, that uh, also have been agreed as part of the same package. Uh, Together, and you can see, I, I won't go into the detail because of the, the time, and I am sure that many of you have been involved in the process of designing both, um, uh, that now we have a moment of relief and respite to say, okay, that battle is won. Uh, the next one is now how to implement them. Not only that, but also to implement the first line on our checklist. The global action plan has also been agreed as part of that package, um, and I'm hoping that hopefully by the end of this week or early next week, um, both these updated documents uh, will, be up, will be up on the web uh, and you can see the link uh, at the bottom of this slide where you'll be able to download both the resolution as well as uh, both documents. The ones that are there this morning are still the ones that went into the discussion, uh, not out of it. The resolution also requires us and gives us two other items on our checklist. It requires us uh, by the end of this year, by November, uh, to put together a global coordinating mechanism on non-communicable non diseases. Um, many issues here, who leads, how does it work, what is the role of non-state actors in, in the process. So uh, let's not relax completely. There's a, a lot of discussion still left on the global arena, and I'm hoping that Ireland and the rest of Europe will be very active in this discussion and in process reporting in uh, how are we going, not just to look at the outcomes uh, indicated uh, by the targets and indicators package, but also how we are getting there, how we report on our progress every couple of years until 2025. In Europe, um, already has been mentioned uh, the Health 2020. This is another achievement um, that was uh, created and adopted by the European member states in Malta at the regional committee uh, last September. This, uh, I would have in any other presentation spent time describing what that one contained, but actually it, is, uh, it contains this. Uh, it's a really wonderful uh, analog of, uh, it's a really wonderful partnership here uh, that the European document could be just an abstract document that what the 53 member states of Europe want to do 
and at the same time, uh, here is Ireland telling we've considered this in the two years coming up to the development of Health 2020 and its adoption last, uh, uh, last September. We've been thinking hard of how this uh, reflects on the needs in our country, and I think rather better than introducing you uh, to Health 2020, look at one of the concrete uh, 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 one of the concrete manifestations of what, are, what is the policy framework placed into national action. And I knew that this would be overlapping with my uh, previous speaker, um, but the themes are also exactly the themes, the strategic objectives and the themes of uh, WHO. And on, on this basis, I also have a request from my regional director, um, Susanna Jakob, to pass on her greetings and her appreciation for the close collaboration that there is um, with the Irish Ministry and with the amount of work that the Irish society has put into the development of this document. I personally am quite interested to see a very comprehensive um, health promotion approach married to uh, an, an interest in uh, health services and, and healthcare reform, including mention of universal health insurance. Um, all important innovations that we shall be watching and hopefully collaborating quite closely. Which, of course, is a challenge faced with the type of scene that we are used to, see, to seeing on our um, television screens in Europe, people coming around and uh, uh, complaining about the loss of a service or the loss of a future in the context of financial crisis and the response that many of European governments are putting into the process, responding to the creation of debt or the, the mass massive debt in, uh, uh, in Europe, uh, uh, indeed across uh, many parts of the world, by going into austerity and forcing a reduction in public service rather than an increase. And as we talk about uh, the, the response to cancer and the response to uh, universal health coverage, we are forced to face where are the resources going to come from. Um, the literature is growing about how a policy of austerity both doesn't achieve its own objectives of reducing debt as well as puts in danger uh, public health, education, and social welfare and uh, has a very direct effect, <clears throat> negative effect on the public health. This is all very important as context as we start to think about how we respond uh, to the treatment side of cancer and we respond to multiple reports in the, uh, in the news media of, of shortages of this drug or the other, when in reality many of the non-communicable disease treatments, both for cardiovascular and metabolic diseases as well as for cancer, are in, in the main, the generics are so good and so cheap as to be um, not quite meriting the profit margin that uh, pharmaceutical companies might like to make out of it, and, and therefore the balance between support for industry and, and producing a good package of treatment that is accessible and affordable by people and by communities is an issue of, of great conflict. But conflict is not just in the area of treatment. Um, last uh, autumn, we all witnessed the unfolding of an interesting story um, that was the courts are still out on the inter interrelationships between what happened last October um, and, uh, uh, and the resignation of the, the commissioner, uh, for the health commissioner in the European Commission. Um, but once the court comes back, uh, whatever is the case, some implication of tobacco uh, is, uh, is there. The tobacco industry, um, either directly or indirectly, is very strongly trying to influence policy and trying to uh, take forward uh, or take backwards the, our work on the tobacco products directive. Um, streets, uh, pro street protests are not just about austerity. This is a group of tobacco protesters, tobacco industry protesters, claiming that their culture and livelihood is being threatened by the tobacco products directive. Uh, the tobacco industry has, uh, is putting in uh, hundreds of amendments uh, into the process and uh, has hundreds of lobbyists in Brussels working against uh, the tobacco products directive. In a Europe where we have felt up to now that we have had some control over the process and we were making progress, 
but in reality we are still far from being world leaders. We are world leaders in the number of uh, people who smoke, at least uh, the proportion of people uh, who smoke, 35 percent um, of our adults uh, are, are smokers, and in terms of WHO regions, um, and this includes the 53 member states, not just the 27 um, of the European Union, we are uh, the world leader among all the WHO regions. We have a long way to go, even as we face the strategies of the tobacco industry in improving uh, the look and targeting uh, their packs and advertising at young people and at women, um, producing packs that uh, pe women can use as fashion accessories um, matching the color of their dress. We must remember as we drive forward with the Tobacco Products Directive that uh, compared to other WHO regions, um, the European region has one of the weakest legal arsenals in the area of packaging and labeling. Our window of opportunity for pushing forward the Tobacco Products Directive and again assuming uh, leadership worldwide um, is closing very rapidly. If it doesn't happen in the next few months, um, then the, the directive is lost and we have to start again with the new commission. Yet again, you're showing leadership. I couldn't resist changing my presentation and taking a picture of the booth out here, so thanks to Emer for posing. Um, the, uh, uh, the, the, I've already sent out the, uh, uh, the news to uh, all over WHO, and congratulations are already coming back in. I, I'm very excited to see this happening and this, this leadership taken. Um, hopefully many other countries will follow on um, again uh, Ireland's, uh, Ireland's leadership. The code, happy birthday or happy silver anniversary, the European Code Against Cancer, part of our um, collaboration and, and discussion here. It, it's one that we need to get through very quickly and, and really update uh, very fast, uh, find a way of using it uh, effectively uh, in, in our communications and in supporting uh, policy. A number of things are quite controversial in it, not least is the fact um, that it seems to imply that there's a safe level of alcohol drinking in, uh, in, in relation to cancer, and that's a very dangerous message, um, especially at a time when we would like to push forward alcohol per capita consumption, um, not just the harmful use uh, of alcohol as the target. In the case of cancer, clearly less is better, um, and, uh, and, and no, no personal threshold um, should be there, but of course we, we have to get this uh, discussed and, and uh, the, the evidence accumulated and, and summarized in a fashion that is effective. But it's not just the area of, uh, of alcohol. I, uh, as an exercise, to produce a pretty picture more than anything, there's no, uh, uh, the, uh, I, I pulled down uh, all the articles ever written on uh, ever indexed on PubMed um, with the keyword of mammography, I, uh, I extracted all the 44,000 authors. I collated all 170,000 or so um, collaborations and I plotted a social network um, which is much larger than the segment that you see here. Um, uh, and you'll see names, maybe people around this room um, who are part of the discussion on, uh, on mammography um, their names and their locations are proportional both to their influence and, and their contribution to, to the literature, and it's a scientific as well as a pretty picture. Um, I wanted this to extract from it the faces of two of those authors. Um, you have seen uh, the, the Marmot Review um, last, uh, last autumn, as well as, uh, you know, Peter Gotch's uh, own writings, and it's almost, we're in mammography, we're at a stage where uh, one or the other must be right and, and not both. Um, and there is an issue here that the controversy, we need to pass over um, the, uh, and have a very good review um, and finally settle at a European level what is the advice that we give to countries. Is it 
that, uh, uh, that overdiagnosis is next to negligible and just an issue of proper communication to, con to women who make their own decision, or is it that overdiagnosis is so great um, as to be harmful um, and, and should lead to the termination of, of mammographic screening programs. Whatever is the outcome of that review, uh, it is my experience in the past uh, couple of years working especially with countries, the accession countries to the European Union and, uh, and beyond in the east of Europe, the issue is not one of whether we screen or not, but the issue is one of whether we have a good system in which early detection could work. Um, and I think to some extent this is an issue that is prevalent across the whole of Europe. We have focused very much on the screening debate and uh, we actually need to go beyond that and look at um, are our health systems, our health insurance systems, our communication systems, our care systems sufficient to provide the best evidence-based care um, that is available. In many countries of Eastern Europe, um, we face the challenge of having to uh, uh, discuss screening uh, in the context of a population where it is mortality among the known cases that is the issue, not whether we want to identify new cases. And so this debate um, needs to be settled as quickly as possible with a good, uh, a good review and a good European consensus, and then we need to move very quickly into what is the system within which our early detection programs are embedded. And not to leave the men out, uh, the code needs to tell uh, men that uh, growing a mustache is absolutely much safer than doing prostate cancer screening and this is much likely to leave you leaky, droopy, much less likely to leave you leaky, droopy or dead. Um, with that pleasant idea, I thank you for your attention.